Warhammer 40,000 The Horus Heresy Book 5 Fulgrim, Visions of Treachery Part 3 Visions of Treachery 15 The Worm at the Heart of the Apple War Calls Kayla Mencha Kine. At first, Fulgrim thought he'd misheard. Surely this alien could not be suggesting that Horus, most loyal son of the Emperor, would betray their father and lead his armies into civil war? The very idea was ludicrous, for the Emperor would never have appointed Horus to the position of war master if he had not been utterly sure of his loyalty. He searched Eldred Ulfran's face for any sign of a jest or that this was all some hideous mistake, for there was no way such an insult could stand unchallenged. Even as he sought to find reason in this exchange, the voice in his head roared in anger. This Zeno filth means to sow the seeds of dissent among you. This is madness. Roared Fulgrim, his anger flaring. Why would Horus do such a thing? The thing. Eldred rose from the ground as the giant Wraithlord behind him widened its stance, and the bone-armored warriors reached for their swords. Eldred held up his staff to halt their warlike motions. His soul is being tempted with visions of power and glory by the gods of chaos. It is a battle he will not win. Lies, 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 lies. Gods of chaos? Cried Fulgrim, as a red mist of hate-fueled power raced throughout his body. What in the name of Terra are you talking about? Eldred's implacable mask slipped and his face was transformed in horror. You travel the warp and yet you know not of chaos? Kind's blood. I see now why they chose your race to strike at. You speak in riddles, Xenos, said Fulgrim. I won't stand for this. You must listen, pleaded Eldred. The warp, as you call it, is home to the most malign beings imaginable, terrible energies that are elemental and ferocious. They are gods that have existed since the dawn of time and will outlast this guttering flame of a universe. Chaos is the worm at the heart of the apple and the canker in the soul that devours from within. It is the mortal enemy of all living things. Then Horus will turn from such evil, said Fulgrim, his hand drawn towards his silver-hilted sword, the purple crystal on the pommel winking with an alluring shimmer. The voice of his unspoken will scream at him. Kill him. He will infect you with lies. Kill him. No, said Eldred, Horus will not turn from it, for it promises him exactly what he wants to hear. He will believe he does what is best for humanity, but he has been blinded to the realities of what he is doing. The gods of chaos have woven falsehoods around him, but these are mere fripperies that lesser minds will use to explain his betrayal. The truth is more prosaic. The fire of the War Master's ambition has been stoked from a steady flame to a roaring inferno, and it will damn the galaxy to an age of war and blood. I should kill you for these words, snarled Fulgrim. I am not trying to anger you, I am trying to warn you, cried Eldred. You have to listen to me. It is not too late to stop this, but you must act now. Warn your Emperor that he is betrayed and you will save billions of lives. The future of the galaxy is in your hands. I will not listen to you. Roared Fulgrim, drawing his sword. Eldred staggered as though a sudden force assailed him. The farcer's dark eyes flashed to the blade and his features twisted in an expression of horror and anguish. No. Cried Eldred, as a great wind that seemed to rise from nowhere howled around the stunned observers. Fulgrim's blade swept out towards Eldred's neck cleaving the air in a sweeping, silver arc. A fraction of a second before the sword took the farcer's head an enormous blade flashed and intercepted its deadly edge. An explosion of sparks burst before Eldred and he staggered away from Fulgrim as the Wraithlord stood erect, its huge sword drawing back to strike at the Primarch. Eldred shouted, They are corrupted. Kill them. Fulgrim felt a massive swell of power fill him as he drew the sword its blade rippling with afterimages of vibrant purple energy. His phoenix guard and captains surged to their feet as he struck his blow against the farcer, 
and guns blazed as a vicious, short-range firefight erupted. The bone-armored warriors charged with an ear-splitting shriek that tore at the nerves, and a hail of bolter fire cut down a handful before they hit home. Fulgrim left the warriors to his captains, as the Phoenix Guard charged the mighty, golden-helmed Wraithlord. You must kill him. The farcer must die before he ruins everything. Fulgrim roared as he leapt after the farcer, the Wraithlord's monstrous sword arcing towards him as the Phoenix Guard slashed at it with their golden blades. He rolled beneath the blow, rising to pursue the architect of this bloodshed. Eldred Ulfrin and the grim-faced warriors in black armor backed away from him towards the curving structure, as a pale nimbus of light began to gather at its base. I tried to save you, said Eldred, but you are already the unwitting tool of chaos. The primarch of the emperor's children swung his sword at the farcer, but his enemy vanished in a flare of light and his weapon clove only air. He roared in frustration as he realized that the structures were in fact teleportation devices. He turned back to the battle raging behind him as a hail of energized bolts spat from the barrels of the nearest skimmer tank's guns. Its first shots had been hesitantly aimed, thanks to the presence of the farcer, but Fulgrim saw that no such caution restrained them now. The prow of the tank skimmed the grass as its pilot brought it around in a tight turn, expecting his quarry to flee, but Fulgrim had never run from an enemy in his life and wasn't about to start now. Fulgrim leapt into the air just as the Eldar pilot saw the danger and tried to gain height. It was already too late. The Primarch's sword hacked through the side of the vehicle and tore downwards, ripping through its hull as he gave a bellow of hatred. The tank's pronged front section dropped to the ground and the vehicle slewed around, the beveled edge carving into the ground, flipping the vehicle over onto its si side with a terrific crack of what sounded like splintering bone. Bright energy exploded from the wreck in a huge plume of light, and Fulgrim laughed in triumph. He spun his sword and returned his attention to the clash of weapons, watching as the terrifying Wraithlord reached down and crushed one of the Phoenix Guard in a massive fist. Armor cracked asunder and blood fell in a crimson rain as the warrior died. Fulgrim snarled in anger as he saw three of his elite Praetorians lying twisted and broken at the machine's feet. His captains fought with the warriors in bone armor, their swords a blur as shrieking war shouts filled the air over the ring of steel on bone. Fulgrim moved away from the blazing wreckage of the tank, his sword aimed at the gold-helmed war machine. As if sensing his presence, the Wraithlord turned its head towards him and hurled aside the dead warrior in its grip. Fulgrim could sense the ghost within the machine as a blazing hunger for vengeance and knew this thing wanted him dead as much as he desired to see it destroyed. With a speed that shocked him, the Wraithlord loped towards him, its agility terrifying. He stepped to meet it and ducked beneath a scything blow of its crackling blade, rising again to hack his sword into its slender arm. The blade bit a fingerbreadth before sliding clear and Fulgrim felt the jarring vibration of the impact along the entire length of his body. The Wraithlord's fist slammed into his chest and punched him from his feet, the eagle-stamped breastplate cracking under the thunderous blow. Fulgrim grunted in pain, tasting blood on his lips. The pain was enormous, but instead of laying him lo low it energized him, and he leapt to his feet with a wild cry of exultation. His wreath hung broken over his face and he ripped it clear, tearing out his plates and smearing the powder and oils across his face. Looking more like a feral savage than the primarch of the Emperor's children, Fulgrim once again launched himself at the Wraithlord. Its huge sword slashed towards him, but he raised his own blade and the two met in a ferocious thunder of metal and fire. The purple gem in the pommel of Fulgrim's sword flared, and the Wraithlord's blade exploded in a shower of bone fragments. Fulgrim pressed his attack as the Wraithlord reeled, and swung his sword in a murderous, two-handed swing at its legs. He roared as the blade smashed into its knee, and tore through the joint with a shrieking howl of pleasure. Rippling coils of energy whipped from the wound as the great war machine swayed for the briefest moment before crashing to the ground. Now finish it. Destroy what lies within its head and it will suffer a fate beyond death. Fulgrim leapt on top of the struggling machine, smashing his fist into the smooth sheen of its golden face with a deafening war cry. 
The surface cracked and split under the force of his blow, and he felt blood spring from his hand. He ignored the pain and hammered his fist against its head again and again, feeling the surface of the machine's carapace-like skull yield to his furious assault. It tried to reach up and hurl him from its body, but he lashed out with his sword, the blade hacking off its huge fist with an ease that had seemed impossible only moments before. At last the golden helm cracked and and Fulgrim tore the Wraith Lord's head open, revealing a smooth ceramic faceplate, pierced and woven with gold wire and engraved with silver runes. Its surface was studded with gleaming gems, and at the center of this arrangement sat a pulsing red stone. Fulgrim could sense the fear emanating from this stone and reached down to pluck it from its mounting, a rising shriek of panic felt in the soul rather than heard. The stone was hot to the touch, and fiery lines danced within its depths, haunted shapes and alien features writhing within it. He felt its anger and hatred towards him, but most of all he felt its dreadful, all-consuming fear of oblivion. Fulgrim laughed as he crushed the stone in his fist, hearing a shrieking howl of anguish flee its destruction. He felt his sword grow warm, and looked down to see the gem at its pommel burn like an amethyst star, as though feeding on the spirit released from the stone. How he knew this he did not know, but next to the elation he felt in victory, it seemed a minor mystery, and no sooner had the realization surfaced than it was gone. As the wondrous feeling of power faded, Fulgrim turned his face towards the battle being fought by his captains. They struggled against the shrieking warriors in bone armor, their swords fencing in a deadly ballet with these supremely skilled warriors. Behind them, the remaining enemy tank waited to support its fellow Eldar, its guns useless while the combat raged. Fulgrim raised his sword and charged. Eldred cried out as he felt the soul of Kyrian Goldhelm torn from its spirit stone and cast into the void, alone and unprotected. He felt the great and terrible hunger of the great enemy devour the mighty soul of the warrior and wept bitter tears of recrimination at his folly in attempting to parley with the barbarous Monke. Never again would he trust that their intentions could be anything other than hostile, and he vowed to remember forever the lesson Kyrian Goldhelm's loss had taught him. The air still shimmered around him after his transit through the webway portal from the surface of Tarsus, and he could feel the psychic roar of violence running through the naked ribs of the craft world's wraithbone skeleton. He could feel the lust for aggression from every Eldar aboard and the racing, molten heartbeat of the Avatar of the Bloody-Handed God as it roused itself from the sealed wraithbone chamber at the heart of the craft world. How could he not have seen this? Fulgrim was already on a dark path, his soul embroiled in a secret war he did not even realize it was fighting. A dark and terrible force sought to dominate him, and though Fulgrim was resisting, Eldred knew there was only one way such a battle could end. He knew now that this dark presence had been what shielded Fulgrim from his sight, jealously keeping its victim veiled so that none might unmask its designs. The sword, he should have felt at the moment he laid eyes upon it, but the deceits of the great enemy had ensnared him with subtle illusions and rendered him blind to its presence. Eldred knew that the essence of a powerful creature from beyond the gates of the Empyrean lay bound within the sword and that its influence was inexorably tainting the consciousness of the Primarch of the Emperor's children. Eldred knew there was only one path open to him, and shouted, to battle. Fulgrim had to be destroyed before he could escape Tarsus. An answering roar of war lust pulsed along the very bones of the craft world. Blood runs, anger rises, death wakes, war calls. The last of the shrieking Eldar were dead, hacked down by mighty sweeps of Fulgrim's sword, and Lucius felt the exhilaration of the fight still pounding within him like music. His sword hissed with a alien blood and his muscles were alive with the skill it had taken to best them. The Megarachnid had been terrifyingly swift, lethal killers who fought with blind, instinctual skill, but these howling warriors, many of whom Lucius now saw were female, were almost as skillful as he. Their blade work had been exquisite. One of them, a female who had fought with axe and sword, had actually managed to land several blows upon him. His armor was cut open in several places and but for his inhuman speed, he knew that he would be lying as dead as the warrior woman at his feet. He reached down and lifted one of their swords, testing it for balance and weight. 
It was lighter than he'd expected and its grip was too small, but its edge was true and it was exquisitely made. Didn't you learn anything on murder? Asked Saul Tarvitz. Get rid of that weapon before Idolin sees you with it. Lucius turned and said, I was just looking at it, Saul. I'm not going to start using it. Just as well, said Tarvitz. Lucius saw that his fellow captain was almost spent, his breath ragged and his armor stained with his own and alien blood, but despite Saul's words, he held on to the alien woman's sword. Everyone still alive? Asked Fulgrim with a laugh. Blood caked the Primarca's breastplate, where the Wraith Lord had struck him, and his appearance was a far cry from the regal splendor Lucius was used to seeing. Though ragged and filthy, Fulgrim had never looked more alive, his dark eyes shining with the excitement of the battle, his sword still clutched firmly in his fist. Lucius looked around the battlefield, only now checking to see who else had survived. Both Lord Commanders were still alive, as were Julius Caesaron, Marius Verasian, and that smug bastard, Solomon Demeter. Of the Phoenix Guard there were no survivors, their skill and strength no match for the power of the Wraith Lord. Looks like it, said Vespasian cleaning his sword on the helmet crest of one of the fallen Eldar. We should get out of here before they ret return in greater numbers. That tank's keeping its distance after what happened to the other one, but it won't be long before the pilot finds his courage again. Leave? said Julius Caesaron. I say we take the fight to that tank and destroy it. These aliens have betrayed the truce of a parley, and honor demands we make them pay in blood. You're not thinking, Julius, said Solomon. We have no weapons to take out a tank and, after what happened to his friend, this one's unlikely to let us get close. We have to go. Lucius sneered. How like Solomon Demeter to run from a fight. He could see Idolin was itching to stay and fight, but Marius Verasian kept his counsel, awaiting the Primarch's decision before undoubtedly supporting it. Silently he urged Fulgrim to order them to attack the tank. Fulgrim's eyes honed in on him, as though sensing his need to inflict more violence. He smiled, his teeth bright against the smudged inks on his face. I think the decision has been taken out of our hands, said Solomon as a bright light once again built at the base of the curved structure where the farcer had vanished. This can't be good, said Tarvitz. Stormbird 1 shouted Vespasian into the Vox. Spool up the engines, we're coming to you right now. My lord, we have to go. Go, said Fulgrim, his voice sounding as though he had just woken from a deep slumber. Go where? Off this planet, my lord, urged Vespasian. The Eldar are returning, returning, and they would not do so unless they had overwhelming force. Fulgrim shook his head as if in pain and put a hand to his temple. The first Eldar warriors emerged from a blazing ripple of light held suspended beneath the apex of the alien portal. The Primarch looked up and saw the Eldar sprint from the light, first in ones and twos, then in squads. Like the dead aliens at their feet, these Eldar wore form-fitting armor of overlapping plates, though these warriors' armor was clear blue, and they sported yellow crests on their helms. Each carried a short-barreled rifle, and they advanced with cautious grace towards the Astartes. Behind them came a pair of the dark-armored Eldar with long-barreled weapons aimed at the Stormbird above them. Lucius twisted his neck and stretched his shoulder muscles in readiness for the fight, but Fulgrim shook his head once more and said, We go. Everyone back to the Stormbird. We will return for our dead when we destroy their craft world and leave them nowhere to retreat to. Lucius swallowed his disappointment and followed his Primarch as they fell back towards the screaming aircraft, its engines building to a shrieking howl. He kept hold of the alien sword as he jogged back up the hill towards the vehicle. Blinding streaks flashed overhead and Lucius was slammed into the ground by the pressure wave of a terrific explosion. More hissing streaks followed in quick succession and secondary blasts filled the air with debris and smoke. He spat dirt and looked up to see the ruins at the hill's summit wreathed in fire. The blazing wreck of the Stormbird lay slumped li like a downed bird, its wings smashed and a cluster of holes punched in its side. 
Run! shouted Vespasian. Once more the Eldar were hurled back from the top of the hill, leaving their dead piled at the foot of the ruins. Wickering gunfire rattled from the cover of the ruins with musical clangs, and slashing beams of incandescent energy lit up the purpling sky in bright streaks. The wreckage of the Stormbird still blazed behind them, secondary explosions of onboard ammunition popping and crackling in the heat. Marius took a deep breath as he slotted another magazine home into his bolter and waited for the next assault. So far every one of them had come through the violence of the Eldar attacks alive, so they all sported wounds from the hails of razor-sharp discs fired by the Eldar weapons. One of the discs lay on the ground next to him and he picked it up, turning it over in his hands. It seemed ridiculous that such a thing could cause injury, but its edges were lethally sharp and could penetrate even Mark IV plate if it struck a weak area such as a joint. It had been a bloody battle, one that had seen desperate heroics and incredible feats of arms. Marius had watched Lucius fend off three of the howling warrior women at once. Fighting with two weapons, his own sword and an Eldar blade, the swordsman had killed them in a dazzling display of unimaginable skill. Vespasian had fought like one of the heroes from the Gallery of Swords, his perfection and purity shining like a beacon as he hurled back green-armored Eldar with bulbous helmets that spat blue fire. Solomon and Julius had fought back to back, killing with brutal vigor, while Saul Tarvitz fought with mechanical precision, lending his sword arm to a multitude of combats. But Idolin, how had he fought? In the thick of the fighting, Marius had heard an ululating howl of nerve-shredding ferocity and turned, expecting to see more of the warrior women charging him. Instead, he had seen Lord Commander Idolin with a trio of shrieking enemies scattered before him. Two were on their knees, clutching their ruptured helmets, while a third staggered as though in the grip of a powerful seizure. Idolin stepped in to finish them, and Marius had been left with the impossible, but unshakable sensation that the scream had, in fact, come from Lord Commander Idolin. How long before the damn firebird gets here? Asked Julius, crawling through the smoldering wreckage towards him, and shaking Marius from his thoughts of the battle. I don't know, he said. Lord Fulgrim has tried to call it down, but I think the Eldar must be jamming our Vox system. Filthy Zeno's bastards, swore Julius. I knew we couldn't trust them. Marius didn't reply, remembering that Julius had been as vocal a supporter of the Primarch's decision to come down to Tarsus as he had. Only Solomon had spoken in opposition, and it looked as though he might be proved right after all. We could all die down here, said Marius sourly. Die? said Julius. Don't be ridiculous. Even if we can't get through to the fleet, it won't be long before they send other ships. The Eldar know that, it's why they're being so careless with their lives. A race on the edge of extinction, are they? What say, you and I push them over that edge? Julius's enthusiasm was infectious and it was hard not be inspired by his indefatigable confidence in victory. Marius smiled in return and said, All the way over. Something's happening below, shouted Saul Tarvitz. Marius scrambled to the edge of the ruins with Julius beside him and looked down at the strange alien gateway. Marius supposed it must lead on to the craft world above, which explained why they had not detected any ships leaving the craft world and how the Eldar had reached the surface of Tarsus first. A gathering of warriors surrounded the light, which flickered and danced like, like a candle flame. Their weapons were appraised, and they chanted in a language that sounded more like song than communication. What do you suppose they're doing? Asked Tarvitz. Julius shook his head. I don't know, but it can't be good for us. Suddenly the light flared and its edges erupted in flames, as though a mighty fire forced its way through it. A shape began to form in the light, massive and dark, its outline humanoid, but surely too large for an Eldar warrior. Marius wondered if they would have to face another of the Wraith Lords. A mighty spear tip emerged first, blazing runic symbols writhing on its wide blade, followed by a brazen arm that bled molten light into the air. 
The limb groaned like hot iron as it flexed and the body it belonged to emerged from the gateway. Solomon let out a breath at the primal horror of the giant warrior that stood at the base of the hill. Towering above the Eldar warriors, the mighty creature's body was fashioned as if from dark iron, its veins rippling like rivers of lava across its surface. Curling horns of smoke and ash oozed from its skin and coiled about its head like a living crown of fire-pierced smoke. Its head was a roaring, wailing terror, and its eyes blazed like ingots straight from the forge. The living avatar of bloody death bellowed its promise of carnage to the skies, and raised its mighty arms, a thick red gore oozing from between its fingers. Thrown alive! Cried Lucius. What is it? Marius looked to Fulgrim for an answer, but the Primarch simply watched the arrival of the monstrous being with apparent relish. Fulgrim unbuckled his golden cloak, which had been shredded by gunfire and blades, and drew his silver sword, the jam at its pommel winking in the twilight. My lord? Asked Vespasian. Yes, Vespasian? Replied Fulgrim, as though only half hearing, hearing his lord commander. Do you know what that thing is? It is their heart and soul, said Fulgrim, the words sounding as though they came from some distant place within him. Their lust for war and death beats within its chest. As the Primarch spoke, Marius watched the brazen warrior take a thunderous step forwards, the grass beneath its feet blackening and bursting into flame in its wake. The chanting of the Eldar warriors grew more strident and they began a slow advance behind the blazing god the rise and fall of their song in time with its every step. Dozens of the warrior women they had fought earlier ghosted through the night, and Marius could hear their piercing shrieks echoing from all around them. Stand ready, warned Vespasian, silhouetted in the glow of the burning stormbird. Marius knew that, while ruins and the wreckage of the stormbird were as good a defensive position as they could hope for, there was no way the eight of them could hold the Eldar at bay for much longer even if one of their number was a Primarch. The bloody-handed god picked up its pace. Marius looked at his fellow captains, seeing the same unreasoning dread of the monster across every face. The power of the dark, fiery idol spoke to their souls of the torments it would inflict and the blazing horror its wrath would unleash on those who defied it. Fulgrim spun his sword and stepped from the cover of the ruins, a chorus of cries following him as he marched to meet the terrifying apparition. Though its features were of carved metal, Marius saw its mouth twist in a grimace of anticipation as the Primarch came towards it. Two mighty gods faced each other, and the world seemed to halt its progress, as though fearful of disturbing the drama being played out upon its surface. Surface. With a mighty bellow of rage, the Eldar god attacked. Fulgrim saw the blazing spear hurtling towards him, and swayed aside as its fiery heat slashed past his head. He laughed as he saw that the Eldar god had disarmed itself, but the laughter died in his throat as he heard the voice in his head scream a warning. Fool! You think Eldar trickery is so easily thwarted? He turned to see the spear twisting in the air like a serpent, swooping back in a graceful arc towards him. It roared as it flew, the noise like the eruptions of a thousand volcanoes. He brought up his sword and deflected the flaming missile, the heat of its passing scorching the skin of his face and setting the plates of his hair on fire. Fulgrim beat his head with his free hand, extinguishing the flames in his hair, and raised his sword in challenge. Will you not fight me in honorable combat? Must you do your killing from afar? The monstrous iron creature plucked the flaming spear from the air, black smoke and spitting embers drifting from its eyes and mouth as it spun the weapon and aimed it at Fulgrim's heart. Fulgrim grinned as he felt the thrill of combat pulsing through every fiber of his being. Here was a foe that would truly test his mettle, for what being had he ever fought that had truly challenged him? The lair? The diasporex? The greenskin? No, this was a creature with a power to match his own, a terrible godlike being that bore the heart of its fading race within its iron breast. It would not be baited or riled with petty insults, it was a warrior creature with one purpose and one pur purpose alone, to kill. Such a one-dimensional aspect made Fulgrim sick, for what was life and death but a series of sensations to be experienced one after another. 
Without sensation, what was life? A wild exultation filled him and his senses seemed to rise to the surface of his skin. He felt every tiny gust of wind as it wound past his body, the heat of the creature before him, the coolness of the planet's atmosphere and the softness of the grass beneath him. He was truly alive and at the height of his powers. Come on then, snarled Fulgrim. Come on and die. The two beings leapt towards each other, Fulgrim's sword slashing down to meet the mighty creature's blade, which he now saw resembled a great sword, where once it had been a spear. Both blades met with a tearing shriek that echoed in realms beyond those of the five senses and an explosion of unlight that left those who saw it blinded. The roaring Eldar god recovered first and its molten sword arced for Fulgrim's head. He ducked and slammed his fist into its midriff, feeling the hard impact on iron and the blistering heat that seared the skin from his knuckles. Fulgrim laughed with the pain, and raised his sword to block a murderous slash towards his groin. The Eldar god attacked with wild, atavistic fury, its blows driven by racial hatred and the ferocious joy of unbound emotion. Flames wreathed its limbs, and dark tendrils of smoke enveloped the two combatants as they struggled. Silver sword and fiery blade sparked and clanged as they traded blows, neither able to penetrate the other's defenses. Fulgrim felt his anger at this blazing monstrosity surge in his veins, its inability to do more than simply fight and kill offending his refined sensibilities. Where was its appreciation of art and culture, beauty and grace? Such a thing did not deserve the boon of existence, and his limbs filled with renewed strength as though a newfound power flowed from his sword arm and into his flesh. He could hear the sounds of battle all, all around him, bolter fire, cries of pain, wickering razor discs from alien weapons, and howling screams, like the cries of the banshees of legend. He paid them no heed, too focused on his own fight to the death. His sword pulsed with a silver glow, streamers of light and power rippling along its length as he swung it, every strike delivered with a roar of ecstasy. The gleam of purple light from the pommel stone was strong, and he could see that the fiery gaze of his foe's eyes was ever drawn to it. A wild idea took root in his mind, and though a powerful surge of denial washed through him at the thought, he knew that it was the only way to defeat his enemy quickly. He stepped in close to the flaming Eldar god and hurled his sword high into the air. Instantly, its burning gaze snapped upwards, the coals of its eyes homing in on the spinning blade. It drew back its arm to hurl its spear at the sword, but before it could throw, Fulgrim leapt towards it and delivered a thunderous right hook to its face. Every ounce of his power and rage powered the blow, and he let loose a bellowing cry of hate as he struck. Metal buckled and an eruption of red light exploded from the Eldar monster's head. Fulgrim's fist hammered through its helmet and into the molten core of its skull and he cried out in agony and pleasure as he felt the blow smash the back of its head. The wounded creature staggered, its head a twisted ruin of metal and flame. Spears of red light streamed from its helmet, and the molten rivers of its blood blazed like phosphor against its iron skin. Fulgrim felt the pain of his maimed hand, but savagely suppressed it as he stepped in again and wrapped his hands around its neck. The heat of its molten skin seared his flesh, but Fulgrim was oblivious to the pain, too intent on his foe's destruction. Plumes of red light streamed from the Eldar god's face, the sound like a manifestation of the, the combined rage and heart of its creators. An age of regret and lust flowed from the creature, and Fulgrim felt the aching sadness of the necessity of its existence pour into him even as it poured out of the dying monster. His hands blackened as he crushed the life from his enemy, the metal cracking with the sound of a dying soul. Fulgrim forced the creature to its knees, laughing insanely as the pain of his wounds vied with the powerful elation he felt in crushing the life from another being with his own bare hands and watching as the life fled from its eyes. The sound of a great and terrible thunder built, and Fulgrim looked up from his murder to see a graceful bird of fire carve its way across the heavens. He released his hold on the dying Eldar creature and punched the heavens as the firebird streaked overhead, followed by a host of stormbirds and thunderhawks. Fulgrim returned his gaze to his defeated foe as whipping light and noise poured from it like the nuclear fire blazing at the heart of a star. The light of the creature's death flared, 
and its body exploded in a thunder of hot iron and molten metal. Fulgrim was hurled through the air by the screaming explosion, and he felt the touch of its power sear his armor and skin. The released essence of a god surrounded him. He saw a whirling cosmos of stars, the death of a race and the birth of a bright new god, a dark prince of pleasure and pain. A name formed from the raw sound of ages past, a bloody paean of birth and a wordless shout of unbound sensation building into a mighty roar that was a name and a concept all at once. Slainish. 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 Even as the name formed, Fulgrim slammed into the ground and laughed as the Emperor's children descended to Tarsus on wings of fire. He lay still, broken and burnt, but alive, oh, how he was alive. He felt hands upon him and heard voices begging him to speak, but he ignored them, suddenly feeling an aching longing seize him as he realized he was unarmed. Fulgrim pushed himself unsteadily to his feet, knowing that his warriors surrounded him, but not seeing them or hearing their words. His hands throbbed and he could smell the scorched ruin of his flesh, but all his attention was fixed on the silver glow that split the night. His sword stood upright in the grass, its blade having come down point first after he had hurled it into the air. It shimmered in the darkness, the silver blade reflecting the light of the firebird and the descending assault craft. Fulgrim's hands itched to reach out and grip the sword once more, but a screaming portion of his mind begged him not to. He took a faltering step towards the weapon, his hand outstretched, though he could not remember consciously ordering it to do so. His blackened fingers trembled and his muscles strained as though forcing their way through an invisible barrier. The siren song of the sword was strong, but so was his will, and what remained of his vision of the dark god's birth stayed his hand for the moment. Only through me will you achieve perfection. The words thundered in his head, and memories of the battle surged powerfully in his mind, the fire and the hunger to kill, and the wondrous elation of a god's death by his own hands. In that moment, the last vestige of his resistance collapsed and he slid his fingers around the hilt of the sword. Power flowed through him, and the pain of his wounds vanished as though from the most powerful healing bombs. Fulgrim stood straighter, his momentary weakness forgotten as though a wash of power suffused every atom of his body. He saw the Eldar fleeing through their shimmering gateway until only the treacherous seer, Eldred Ulfren remained standing forlornly beside the arching structure. The seer shook his head and stepped into the light, which vanished as suddenly as it had appeared. My lord, said Vespasian, his face smeared with blood. What are your orders? Fulgrim's anger at the alien's perfidy reached new, undreamed of heights, and he sheathed his sword, turning to face his gathering warriors. He knew that there was only one way to ensure that the treachery of the Eldar was burnt out forever. We return to the pride of the Emperor, he said. Order every ship to make ready to fire a spread of virus bombs. Virus bombs? Asked Vespasian. But surely only the War Master. Do it! Shouted Fulgrim. Now! Vespasian looked uneasy with such an order, but nodded stiffly and turned away. Fulgrim cast his gaze out over the night-shrouded planet before him and whispered, By the fire, I swear that every one of the Eldar worlds will burn. <laughs>